on this episode of Serial Killer Earth. Oh my God, we know a savage wildfire threatens to incinerate Russian firefighters. You want me These people are in grave danger. Don't ever do this. In Kansas, a vicious tornado attacks helpless motorists. It was the only time in my life that I thought I was going to die. You got a blaze, buddy. And in Korea, a massive landslide bears down on the citizens of Seoul, trapping them in its deadly surge. At the core of this planet lies the heart of a killer. <laughs> using weapons that are fierce and uncontrollable, claiming thousands of victims each year. But now, eyewitnesses can document this predator. OK, our mouth's on fire. Our mouth's on fire. Tracking every move. Oh, no, 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 no. Allowing some to stay one step ahead. <laughs> Genoa, Italy, the birthplace of Christopher Columbus and the largest Italian port city. Local people proudly call it La Superba, in honor of its glorious past and impressive monuments. The city of Genoa is a world heritage site, a medieval city built of stone buildings that are built to last. But beneath this beautiful landscape lurks an ever-present threat. Genoa is in a flood-prone region. It is near the edge of some very high mountains and at the confluence of a number of rivers. And so these factors put together, along with the hilly topography, can lead to a real flooding danger. In November 2011, the stage is set for one of the worst disasters in Genoa's history. A relentless downpour drenches the city. You had a very intense area of low pressure stalled out over the Mediterranean Sea that was able to pump in a lot of moisture, a lot of rainfall. In six hours' time, Genoa received about a third of its annual rainfall amount, some 14 inches of rain. No place on the planet can really sustain that kind of rainfall rate. There's lots of pavement everywhere. There's very little open ground for the water from this rainfall to soak in and therefore it runs off almost immediately and starts heading straight for the rivers and the lowest streets. After a week of torrential downpours, water surges over the riverbanks and inundates the city. The water literally burst the banks of the river and flowed through the medieval city. After picking up his daughter from school, Claudio Galliano suddenly finds himself plunged into a watery nightmare. The streets were really dangerous because the water was such a powerful vortex. Claudio's camera documents a terrifying journey through an apocalyptic deluge. We see the water pouring out of a parking garage down narrow streets, narrow alleys, like, like tributaries feeding into a large river. The water wants to spread out, but it can't. It's a labyrinth of narrow streets and big stone buildings. The stone buildings are like concrete walls of a canal. Steep steps to the higher areas of the city instantly become cascading waterfalls filling the streets below. The flash floods catch pedestrians completely unawares and they're immediately at risk of being swept away. From her window, Roberta Bernasconi watches the situation get more dangerous by the second. I saw that the water was starting to rise. People were walking around calmly and carelessly. And I was telling them from the window, leave, leave, go away. I was very worried because I had my daughter in my arms. I saw that the situation was getting visibly worse. The force of the torrent hurls Claudio and his daughter into the seeding water, making their fight to safety ever more hazardous. I wasn't able to stay upright because of the force of the water. I was scared because I didn't know where to hold on to. 
I saw people holding onto posts. Otherwise, they would have been dragged away. As rising water continues to engulf the streets, motorists panic and try to flee. But no vehicle is a match for the awesome power of the current. The extreme force of the water can easily carry vehicles and even structures downhill. Roberta watches in mounting horror as churning rapids start to submerge her city. I saw slowly, more and more, a motorbike, all the cars, slowly and slowly, everything was being taken away. We see that water deepen, and as it deepens, it gains power. Flood water has now transformed Genoa, turning it into a disaster zone. This new river is running in a place that it never was meant to be. It's running through city streets. The streets are steeply sloped. The water is rushing down 10, 15, 20 miles an hour, which doesn't sound like much. But the force of moving water goes up with the square of the velocity. So the force of water at 10 miles an hour is four times as great as the force of water at five miles an hour. It can push and lift people and cars all around, treating everything like little toys. That would be so I even saw people who were locked in their cars being dragged away. Yeah. The cars at the top of the street kept coming down, so you could see all the cars pile up, one on another, and plugging up water too. Cars, buses, trucks, all stacked up like dominoes in intersections. We have gridlock by flood. One motorist tries to escape the mud-clogged surge, but it's too late. The powerful currents carry the vehicle away in a terrifying tumult, sending its occupants to their probable death. And that water is so deep, so powerful, it's actually a fatal stream. It was the end of the world. This flood could have been much worse. The buildings were largely unscathed because they were constructed of heavy masonry and the flooding was not very deep. Had the buildings been built of weaker materials and the flood waters deeper, the buildings would have been swept away. When it rains, even still today, I think about those moments. If I hadn't lived this experience myself, I wouldn't have believed it. This historic city is a testament to mankind's great building's achievements, but the overwhelming power of nature can destroy them in moments. The way it looks now, it seems like nothing. But on the day, it was a raging river. Now, when it rains and I see it starting to get worse, I begin to worry. Uh, Viksa, Russia. For hundreds of years, this region of forests and farmland has been at the mercy of punishing winters. But in the summer of 2010, its people fall victim to the opposite extreme. A record-breaking heat wave scorches Eastern Europe. For several weeks, the temperature soars to 38 degrees Celsius and above. The heat wave that hit Russia may be a part of an even bigger puzzle. Namely, if we go to the Indian Ocean, it was monsoon season. The monsoon air pushing into Pakistan shoved so much air into the upper atmosphere, apparently went all the way up, came back down in Russia, and descending air warms. There's the heat wave, there's the drought. To this point, the planet has merely preheated the oven. On the 9th of July, it turns up the flame.
Over 500 fires break out through the countryside, many spontaneously. Some of these fires were started through spontaneous combustion. Peat, which is decaying vegetation, can ignite on its own and then will just burst into flames. Once they get started in this fire weather, there's nothing stopping it. Fanned by high winds across acres of parched grassland, the wildfire footprint becomes so vast, emergency services are stretched to the limit. Remote cities like Vixa are left to fend for themselves. We grabbed our shovels because we wanted to do what we could to help. We didn't expect nature would be so terrible up close. Resident Evgeny Churayev and his friends decide to take matters into their own hands. But they're unprepared for the impact of the blistering heat. A strong wind blew and the fire began to spread to the houses on the street, one after another. The fire is relentless, ravenously consuming buildings, farms, crops and acres of forest. Houses were burning one by one. There was panic as people started running away. As the flames encircle them faster than expected, they realize they must make a dash for it. Evgeny leads a column of vehicles on a burning road out of the town. They have no idea they're driving into the very mouth of hell. In Vixa, Russia, a group of volunteer firefighters think they're driving away from a blazing inferno. But instead, they're unwittingly heading directly into it. These people are in grave danger. Don't ever do this. You drive away from fires. You don't drive into fires. Evgeny's caravan ventures deeper into the heart of the blaze. Our aim was just to get back. It seemed the grass was on fire in some places. No big deal. We thought we could pass. But before long, they find they're ambushed by burning trees falling onto the road ahead. The caravan gridlocks behind Evgeny's car. They're trapped. The noose tightens around them. You're looking at a road with fire on it. Can you drive through that? You're going to be breathing smoke, you'll carbon dioxide, and your gas tank is highly liable to explode, erupt, and incinerate you on the spot. If a window were to burst, they would be immediately overwhelmed with toxic gases, temperatures maybe in the thousands of degrees. It's just a matter of moments before they'll be asphyxiated and burned to death. I started thinking, my God, what am I doing? With no other options available, they make one last desperate effort to escape the encroaching flames. They propel the car forward, bumping over the burning debris. We saw some lights and followed them. It was over. We were lucky. If we'd become lost, we wouldn't have escaped. It would have been a whole different story. Evgeny and his friends survived their ordeal. But wildfires in Russia continue to rage out of control all through August. Typically in a region that's been dried out by drought for a long, long time, you don't just get one fire. The conditions are so primed that if you get one, you're liable to get a dozen, you're liable to get hundreds. And in Russia, unfortunately, it was the worst case, more than 500 fires burning at the same time. When I was a boy, there were forest fires. 
but everything I had seen before was just nothing compared to this. I'd never seen such fire. I hope I'll never see such fire again. Oklahoma, well known all over the world as the heartland of America, this state has another characteristic that sets it apart. Unfortunately, this one can kill. Where did the big hailstorms hit? The epicenter is the state of Oklahoma. They get more than 25 of these big hailstorms per year. Hailstorms tend to happen in locations where you have hot, moist air colliding with relatively cool, dry air. It's these forces that cause the warm, moist air to rise up and start the cycle that leads to a thunderstorm and hail. And Oklahoma, unfortunately, is exactly this kind of location. These stones can be moving at 100 miles per hour. If a 100-mile-per-hour chunk of ice hits you in the head, it can very easily kill you. A thunderstorm unleashes a ferocious assault on the state capital. Oh my God, that's insane. This particular hailstorm was actually a warm front that was moving through that caused a lot of instability in the atmosphere. Big chunks of ice bombard the city. This hailstorm reminded me of a Civil War battlefield with cannonballs landing all around you. When I see baseball and softball size hail, that tells me this is an enormously powerful thunderstorm. Softball sized hail is relatively rare because when you think about it, here's a drop of rain that's frozen into ice. Ice makes it heavier, it wants to fall, but that means updrafts of wind have to pick it up and hold it up. Then what happens is the hailstones fall down and melt slightly and are coated with more water. Then they're carried up again by more updrafts to be coated by an additional layer of ice. At that point, they start to fall. Oh, my God. Student Bonnie Tibbs is at home with her family when the house is suddenly besieged. Oh, my God, it's hitting the window. This hail is loud, and it's big. OK, get away from the windows. And it's slamming up against our house. It was like rocks were being pelted at our house. I literally moved away from the kitchen window, and moments later, large shards of glass were flying out. And so that's when I screamed to get in the closet. On the other side of town, Mac Maddox and his fiance find their home suddenly assailed by ice bombs. Freaking It felt like at one point we were under assault. Oh my God. We hear the skylights getting busted out and, and, and shards of glass going everywhere. Did it bust through? Yeah, the house is literally shaking. It feels like there was an army outside just taking a machine gun to the entire apartment. I start to worry about even our lives at this point. The storm intensifies, and Mac realizes he's in a life-threatening situation. Windows were getting busted out. Blinds were getting ripped off of the windows on the inside. There were shards of siding that was getting blown off. It felt like we were in the middle of a war zone. Oh, my God! 20 minutes later, I'm right now. the Tibbs emerge from hiding. The onslaught shatters windows and skylights, letting in ice bombs that destroy their belongings. After the skylights are completely gone and you've got these six giant holes in your house, it continued to rain. In the house. It actually came onto the rugs and the furniture, the walls, everything. It's in my room. It's Crazy to think that uh, your day could start off uh, absolutely normal. This is the aftermath. Windshield shattered in my car. And just literally a matter of minutes could turn into, uh, you know, your whole livelihood getting destroyed. 
hail like this, it destroys car windows, puts big dents in cars. If a person happened to be unlucky enough to be outside and have no shelter, it could seriously injure or even kill them. Unbelievable. To see actually literal baseballs and golf balls flying from the sky and, and totally tearing everything apart, I don't know if I'll ever see anything, anything like that again in my life. Our kitchen went Mother Nature got us good. We always thought we could outsmart her or she wasn't going to affect us. It's in my room. We know that we can be affected and that we can't outrun her. Coming up. I jumped out of the car and yelled. We had nothing. We had no alternatives, no options. And we see a hillside of mud rock so saturated with water that it literally bursts like a giant water balloon. Wichita, Kansas. Situated almost at the center of the continental United States, it would be the bullseye on a target map of America. And year after year, it's the perfect target for violent tornadoes. Wichita, Kansas, Tornado Alley. Flat topography where tornadoes play out their power. You're really right in between two contrasting air masses. You have warmer subtropical type climate down to the south as that moisture moves in. And then also you're in the same area where it is a continental climate. You can have a tornado at any time during the year. A whole host of deadly tornadoes attacks Kansas and Oklahoma. In a 19-hour period, dozens of twisters roar across both states, turning solid structures into splinters. Here we are in the middle of spring, late spring, starting to go into summer, really right at the zenith of tornado season in Tornado Alley. Television news reporter Greg Jarrett and his cameraman are driving 35 miles northeast of Wichita. It was actually my day off, and my photographer, Ted Lewis, and I were out working on a documentary just on our own time, when all of a sudden, things started to drop out of the sky. Shingles, clothing, and it was raining down debris, which we thought was quite odd. They're unaware that lethal tornadoes have just killed 17 people in two Wichita suburbs. And suddenly, we spotted a funnel cloud on the horizon. The journalists realize they're in the middle of a breaking news story, so they get to work. We pulled over to the side of the road, pulled out our camera, and started shooting it. They have no idea that they've just put themselves at risk of becoming the next headline. Well, I didn't fully appreciate the size of it, the girth, the force, the speed. It started to bear down on us so very quickly. The uh, tornado ran along the ground for 66 miles, but not at a constant strength. It went from F2 all the way up to F5. So the intensity of it varied significantly. Okay, let's get out of here. Realizing the gravity of their situation, Greg and Ted decide to take off. Go, 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 shoot it. Better floor it, better floor it. Shoot it. We're all right, just stay ahead of it. Once we're inside the vehicle and we're trying to get away from it, it kept gaining on us. No, go, no. go, go. I had the pedal to the metal. It was an old car loaded down with equipment, so it wasn't moving very fast. Lots faster, lots faster, lots faster, Greg's catching us. Outrunning a tornado is very difficult at times. A tornado can travel between 30 and even 70 miles per hour. Therefore, it can be very difficult to outdrive. You gotta go, buddy. But I was going as fast as it could, and it was still gaining on us. As if it had eyes. I'm coming after you, and I'm gonna kill you. And it was the only time in my life that I thought I was going to die. You got a blaze, buddy. But the tornado is traveling with them along the same road, and there are no turnings off in sight. Yeah, we want to jump out. There's an overpass ahead, and the men decide it's their only hope of survival. Yeah, I think that's it. 
We pulled up under the overpass and I could see other cars that were parked there and people were standing outside their cars. The others seeking shelter are a father and his two daughters who have parked their vehicle under the bridge. I felt like our chances are better under that bridge than out here in the open. Let's go. I think. Let's go. I jumped out of the car and yelled. Get up under the girders. And I pointed up to the girders that were up the dirt embankment. Is that where you want to go? Yes. We had nothing. We had no alternatives, no options. So we did the only logical thing that we could do, and that was to find a structure that was solid. Shove yourself right up underneath and hang on to them. Come on, Dad. 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 The group watches in horror as the tornado devours a minivan just yards away from the underpass. As they cling on for dear life, they can't help but wonder if they're next for the chop. I kept thinking to myself, I can't die like this at this young age in Kansas. Scientists have argued that when you get under a freeway overpass, you're actually lifting yourself up higher and into the stronger winds. The wind speeds actually speed up through the wind tunnel effect, if you will. And you can have 150, 180, 200 mile per hour winds inside of that basic wind tunnel. 12 heart stopping seconds later, the tornado moves on. It sounded like a freight train. It just passed right on top of us. People very upset. They're still hanging on, hanging on for their lives. It was so loud, it was so impressive that it's like you could feel it down in your bones even. Well, I was very happy, relieved. The danger was obviously passed. Though badly shaken, everyone beneath the overpass survives. Remarkably, so did the two passengers in the doomed minivan, although their injuries are severe. He's got a good heartbeat, but he's not awake. think of how lucky I was. I mean, I've reported from the Middle East. I covered Iraq and Fallujah at the outset of the war, getting shot at. Uh, that was nothing compared to the power of a tornado. Coming up. We have to be in a concrete block house. I don't know if we the worst yet. At a certain point, we're sitting there, and my brother-in-law says, the roof is gone. Then. Now, a crane that is perched on the side or the top of the building is probably not that firmly attached to the building. Would you believe this woman just went through hours of labor and delivered a baby? Miami, Florida. New father, Stan Goldenberg, thinks this day will be the happiest of his life. At 4.35 that afternoon, uh, we had our first daughter, Pearl. <laughs> but 300 miles away, Mother Nature gives birth to a different kind of offspring. His name is Andrew. As Hurricane Andrew neared the Bahamas, he intensified to category five status with wind speeds near 175 miles per hour and hit the Bahamas. After savaging the Bahamas, Hurricane Andrew proceeds to threaten Florida's east coast. As a meteorologist, Stan knows how dangerous hurricanes can be. But he also knows it's too late to move his hospitalized wife, newborn daughter, and three sons out of harm's way. I could not imagine having to deal with the storm in the middle of having to deal with a birth. All residents in the hurricane warning area must take immediate precautions to protect life and property. 
I, like thousands of other people, really could not comprehend how bad this thing would be. Believing his wife and baby are better off in hospital, Stan decides to weather the approaching storm at home with his sons. Assuming the building is safe, a group of friends and relatives has joined them. Say hi. hi. Started to be gusty outside and breezy and started to hear the roar. It looks like maybe 30 miles an hour, maybe 40 mile an hour gust. Sweeping in from the Atlantic, the hurricane slams into the Florida coast and starts to destroy everything in its path. This hurricane was a Category 5 storm when it went on shore, with sustained winds of up to 185 miles per hour. In some ways, Hurricane Andrew being so small, only 90 miles in diameter, was a lot like a tornado. An EF5 tornado with wind speeds of 200 miles per hour is comparable in some ways to this hurricane because you had a very intense circulation right in the center, just like a tornado. Stan videos the storm's approach. Yeah, the power is out, so I don't know if you can see anything except maybe a few lightning flashes. He's totally unaware that what's about to happen will change his life forever. It is blowing out there. I certainly have never seen anything like it before. I don't know if we've hit the worst yet. We happen to be in a concrete block house. If I had had any idea how much devastation the storm would have caused, we would have probably been out of there. But we didn't know. Oh, boy. It got worse and worse and scarier and scarier. We lost the plywood on the front window. Then, at a certain point, the eye wall hit. It just moved it to another dimension, and things just started to rip apart. We're sitting there, and my brother-in-law says, the roof is gone. And the next thing that happened is the wall between the kitchen and the living room fell on us. By morning, Andrew has moved on, leaving Miami damaged beyond recognition. The most damage came from the winds of the hurricane. It looks just like a series of EF5 tornadoes went through that area. You had trailers that were destroyed. You had buildings that were taking off of their foundation. 90% of the roofs in Dade County alone were blown off. In its fury, this compact but awful monster has smashed to bits nearly everything the Goldenbergs cherish. Our car, I believe, is smashed somewhat. We are glad to be alive. Ooh. This is the wall, fell on top of us. We're underneath here. And this is where we crouched. I was pinned very heavily down there. Miraculously, the Goldenbergs and their friends all endure the hurricane's wrath without serious injury. We were scared. We really thought we could die. Hurricane Andrew destroyed so many homes that 180,000 people were made homeless, and total damages in today's dollars are approaching $50 billion. People who have not been through a storm like this cannot imagine what it's like. It's a lesson worth remembering. You can run from nature's fury, like, oh boy. but you can't hide. Taipei, Taiwan. Situated at the northern tip of Taiwan, this capital city has over two million inhabitants. It's the cultural and economic hub of the nation. And it also has a thriving commercial district running through the heart of the city. When local government officials launch a plan to build the world's tallest skyscraper in the center of Taipei, they employ state-of-the-art design techniques. You have a lot of engineering talent in that area. The building is being built for permanence. But even the strongest building is vulnerable to unstable conditions beneath it. Taiwan is an extremely active area seismically. 
with earthquakes on magnitude of seven occurring every few years. From a structural perspective, uh, the tower had a very robust design with massive columns and a, a heavily braced core to essentially bend with the forces from the earthquake. Unfortunately, sound building codes only offer protection when a structure has been completed. Until then, this skyscraper is defenseless against whatever nature decides to throw at it. Two crane operators are 55 stories up in the air when a 7.1 earthquake rocks the half-finished tower. The crane operators are, are in position. In the morning, they climbed up uh, into their cab. Within a matter of a few seconds after the strong shaking starts, the bolts on the towers fracture and the cranes stop lower. They're not fastened down or protected. So when that earthquake comes, well, we see the tragedy. The heavy cranes plummet from the construction zone, sending the workers inside the cab to an instantaneous death. There is no escape for the operators. But had this accident occurred at morning rush hour, noon hour, evening rush hour, we would have seen many more fatalities. Incredibly, the building itself survives the quake unscathed and is open for business two years later. Remarkably, high rises are less susceptible to earthquake damage than are mid-rise buildings, say buildings from two or three stories up to 10 stories are the most vulnerable. The building is constructed to withstand earthquakes and it came through fine. But nobody could have predicted that mother nature would interrupt the construction and cause this tragedy. Seoul, South Korea. Nature often tests the 10 million people who live here with extreme seasonal weather. South Korea has a subtropical humid climate and a subtropical continental climate, meaning they have very cold winters and the summers are hot, sweltering, humid. They are affected by the East Asia monsoon season. But one summer storm proves unusually savage. In July 2011, the sprawling city is deluged by a relentless downpour, resulting from a low-pressure system that refuses to budge. Floodwaters have already swamped 800 houses. Rescuers frantically evacuate residents from low-lying areas, and mud and rocks have begun to wash down the rain-soaked hillsides. The saturated ground cannot absorb another drop of water. We've already had a month's worth of rain. And then in about a 24-hour period, the rain was falling at two inches per hour. This was the most intense rain system that they had had in over 100 years for this area. Seoul receives a lot of rainfall, almost five feet a year. Here. On this one day, in 17 hours, they received 21 inches. That's an enormous amount of rain. From his 22nd story balcony, Wong Gu Li, a lawyer, documents the deluge pouring off the nearby hills. The pouring rain was beyond our imagination. I've never seen such a huge downpour in my life. I was looking down at the South Circular Highway with the water and mud tumbling down. The hills and the mountainous area there just couldn't withhold that much water. But when the land starts to give way, there's really nothing that can stop it. We 
we see a hillside of mud rock so saturated with water that it can't hold the water and it literally bursts like a giant water balloon and charges 40 miles an hour, taking everything with it. Mud flows of this size can be extremely destructive. When rain saturates the side of a hillside, the rain can soak into the soil, increasing its weight tremendously, but also lubricating it with respect to the slope below. The flood engulfs a motorist with a dashboard-mounted camera. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time. The current carries the driver away on a terrifying journey. You've got trees that are being snapped like toothpicks. Each one of these trees weighs a couple thousand pounds. The onslaught of crushing debris continues to roar down the mountain. Mud flows of this size you can slam into the sides of buildings and crush them and then use them to scour the land in front of them. Wongu is terrified that the wall of mud will cause his block of flats to collapse. I was in a panic. I was thinking, my apartment building will surely collapse. The car-crushing mud flow eventually runs out of steam and slides to a halt. The damage is staggering. Wangu's building is still standing, but only just. The walls are destroyed. The apartments in the lower three or four stories of this building are completely destroyed. Fortunately, that apartment building is built with a reinforced concrete frame. So the beams and columns survive the force of this onrushing debris. Thus, the entire apartment building doesn't collapse. The power was awesome. I couldn't believe that rocks so big had been forced inside my building. I was sad and shocked. There were people buried in the mud. Many people had died. Incredibly, the motorist escapes unharmed. The driver was very lucky. Almost 24 inches of rain fell on Seoul that day. It set a record for modern times, and it took weeks to clean up the mess and debris. Everyone here hopes that record will never be broken again. The force of Mother Nature is awesome. There's no match whatsoever for a wall of mud and land and trees and debris.